So, I want to welcome everyone here today. We had a very good turnout. And uh, I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, this is about local politics. And uh, I've said to my classes many times, local politics is as important as anything that's happening on the national level. So, I, I'm really excited about this event. And uh, speaking to us today are, 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 are two people. The first is the town manager of Plainville, and this is Mr. Robert Lee. This is his assistant, Scott Colby. And so they'll both have some good words to say about the importance of local government, why to get involved, and some of the opportunities that exist for young people at the local level. And so it's going to be a, a very good conversation, I'm sure. Uh, first, a little bit about Mr. Lee. He was uh, town manager of Hebron before he took the job as Plainville town manager, and he's been in this role for 14, going on 15 years. Um, he has a great deal of experience understanding the relationship between state and local government. Uh, we try to talk about these things in our, our political science courses here. And he has turned Plainville into a, a, a very financially stable town over the last 14 years of his leadership. Uh, there was a councilwoman I came across who said this about Mr. Lee. He's a very good listener. And she rightly points out that people who are good listeners tend to make good decisions. And I think that is very true of Mr. Lee based on what I've read, what I've heard. And so he can serve as a role model for political leaders in all levels of government. And I think uh, the more that our leaders listen rather than speaking, especially speaking when they don't exactly think about what they say, the better off we are in a civil and a democratic society. I hearken back to George Washington. He spoke very seldom, but when he spoke, people listened. Um, and so I think this uh, is a, a, a good chance to hear someone who has some good things to say, but is also a very good listener. In addition, Mr. Lee maintains uh, what has been called an open-door policy, which means that anyone who has a concern in his town can voice their concerns in a very accessible way. And I think that's very important for, for town leaders to engage their residents in. Um, so just to remember also, this event is sponsored by the Civic Engagement Institute. Many of you know this organization. It's a campus organization that's about a year and a half old. We have been allotted some funds to pay for the food. We are giving an honorarium in honor of Mr. Lee being here to the Plainville Historical Society. And so those funds can only be made possible through the Civic Engagement Institute. So we are glad to have Mr. Lee and Mr. Colby here. So please welcome Robert Lee, Plainville Town Manager. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Uh, I will tell you that it's, it's been a while since I've been in, in school, and uh, the chairs have changed. They're very much different than when I went to school. They're very comfortable, so uh, I'm not sure that uh, it'll keep you all awake, but uh, I'll try. And second thing is uh, that people ask me all the time, my name is Robert Lee. They said, is your middle initial E? And the answer to that question is yes. My name is Robert E. Lee. Just get that out of the way right away. So uh, I've uh, just worked in uh, Connecticut local government for, for 40 years. And uh, so it's, it's been a, you know, quite a ride. And uh, I've enjoyed pretty much every minute of it. Uh, and, I'm, and my goal today is to kind of talk a little bit about civic engagement, how you can get involved, what opportunities there are out there, both as a volunteer and as, you know, perhaps, you know, considering it as a profession or a career. Uh, and also, to, you know, answer questions that you may have about it as well. But before I get started, I'd like to know a little bit about who I'm speaking to and uh, learn a little bit about, about you. So I'd like to go around the room and just have you say your name, what town you're from, and whether you have a, a career choice at this point in time. And if it's undecided, it's undecided. But uh, I'd like to just you know, get an idea of, uh, if you just want to give your first name, that's fine, first name, last name. But just kind of give it, I'd like to know what town you're from and, and, and if you have a career choice at this time or where you might be thinking about going. So I'll start here because you look happy. All right. Uh, quite the diversity in here in terms of uh, you know, uh, where people live as well as, you know, and it sounds like there's, there's a few people who 
a lot of people in here who, who kind of have an idea of where they want to go. And so, uh, you know, maybe the volunteerism may, may have a more of a civic engagement as far as volunteerism may, may be more important than the career side, but I'll, I'll, I'll touch on both. Uh, I'm not sure that things were any different uh, for me when I graduated high school is, is, is I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I got out, you know, when I got out, I went to college and, and, uh, uh, and I ended up, uh, you know, just taking some general courses. Uh, I went to Rutgers College in, in New Jersey and, uh, and uh, I ended up uh, liking, you know, political science courses and, and I became a political science major and people said to me, you know, what are you going to do with a poli-sci major? Because you know, a lot of times, you know, people would become lawyers if you're a poli-sci major and that wasn't something that was necessarily appealing to me. But what, what I found that I liked was, was engaging with people. And uh, when I got out of college, uh, my parents were lived in Connecticut, so I came up to Connecticut. I figured I'd have some free time on my hand to, to, to perhaps begin my career. And uh, I began working, and I was able to get a job in the town that I lived in, which was the town of East Hampton, which is, you know, across the river. And East Hampton had a chief administrative officer at that time. And uh, they hired me under an old program that it was a federal program that, that paid for towns to hire young people like myself at the time. And, uh, and it was a, it was an entry level position called special projects coordinator. Uh, the special project that, that they assigned me to do fresh out of college was to, na to number the houses in town. At that time in, in, in East Hampton, they had rural roots and they didn't have, they didn't have the numbers on the houses. And, and so, so, it seems like a you know kind of a mundane type of uh, assignment, but what it ended up doing for me was was you know I had a you know you had to do research. There's, you don't just go down that you know just, you don't just go down the street and just number them. You, I mean there's a, there's a process. You have to uh, you have to sell it to the town town board of selectmen. You have to you have to have public hearings, uh, and then you have to implement the program. So 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 it was just a uh, something to get your feet wet, and and. Uh, we ended up, uh, do, that program took about a year to implement. And, uh, and, and you know, you find out why, you know, why you're, why you're doing these things, uh, you know, how important it is to the community to have, you know, numbered houses, except I live on this street and, you know, it gives the emergency vehicles an opportunity to, to find you quicker and all those kinds of things. So, so it, it, it gave me some experience with all aspects of, of you know, a lot of aspects of, of town government. After that, uh, project ended. The town was 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 developing a large sewer project, a thirty million dollar sewer project, putting sewers in town around the lake, and uh, they needed someone to kind of administer that. They had s seen what I had done with uh, with the uh, with the other projects, and so it's just one thing leads to another. And uh, I was the liaison between the town manager at the time, the water pollution you know control authority, which was responsible for the project. You, you get to, you know, uh, learn about contractors, about, you know, meeting with, you know, public issues, with problems with construction, uh, how it Im impacts their neighborhoods and whatnot. Uh, so you hit all the aspects of things like construction contracts, budgeting, finance, dealing with the public, purchasing property. We, we purchased easements, road repaving, attending numerous uh, meetings, uh, legal disputes, developing a system to pay for the project, Hiring employees, managing employees, so uh, these are you know when you get involved in a, in, in a small community, uh, you know you, local community, you're seeing things from the beginning to end, and uh, you know if you work for the state government, you're somewhat removed from the public, and if you move you know if you're in federal government, you know you're you're even further removed from from the public, and it's more of a bureauc bureaucracy. So from my choice, working on a local uh, level was is is, is certainly uh, rewarding. And, uh, and uh, uh, you could see the benefits of it uh, you know, pretty quickly. Because of, because of my experience in East Hampton, I worked there for 11 years, uh, it was time to move on. The town of Hebron was looking for their first town manager, chief administrative officer. I applied for the position. There were 80 people who applied for that position, and I was able to secure it because of you know, the, the experiences that I had in East Hampton. I worked there for 14 years, and then you know, it's a relatively small town, and you know, again on that side of the river, and there was an opening in, in Plainville, and uh, and I applied for that position. I, I I forget how many people applied for it. It was probably in the area of 40, and and I was able to you know keep compete against those those others, and 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 based upon the experience that I've that I've gained over the years, I I, I worked at you know I was able to secure the job in in in, uh, in Plainville in 2004, but I think in many ways, you know, that's you know as a town manager. You know, in talking to my colleagues, it's kind of a typical way 
that uh, you, you get, you know, you develop your, your career in, in, uh, in government, and that is you start, you know, uh, pretty much on a small uh, uh, project basis. Uh, you really have no idea, uh, you know, pretty much what you're doing early on, and you just, uh, uh, and you learn from the people that you're working with. And, and over time, um, if you really like uh, 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 seeing things from beginning to end, talking to people, learning things, and and uh, and getting things accomplished. You know, local government is certainly something that uh, uh, you can go you can go pretty far. Uh, as the town manager, uh, and and you know, people that you know live in Bristol and New Britain and you know New Milford and uh, uh, you know uh, and other communities, they have a different form of government. As the town manager, I'm the I'm the uh, the administrative head of the community, which means that the town council or the elected leaders of the town hire me to administer the town. I'm not an elected person. So they hire me based upon my experience, uh, you know, based upon, uh, uh, you know, my schooling, you know, and, and, and based upon what they see as a good fit for the community. Uh, I'm responsible for all aspects of local government administration except the education department, which is, you know, education area, which is managed by the superintendent of the schools. I followed the direction, basically, of the town council. They set the policy uh, in Plainville. It's a seven-member board, uh, and, and again, they're the chief elected officials. A fairly simple analogy is, is, is they tell me where, where they want the town to go, and I pretty much steer the ship and take us there. I pretty much, you know, for the most part, uh, set the course, make the, the adjustments that are necessary, and get us to where the, where the council wants us to go. I, I can honestly say that in my 40 years working, for the t working in local government that I've enjoyed pretty much, uh, pretty much most of the days that I've, that I've worked, uh, despite the fact I get told fairly regularly, I can't, you know, I'd never want to do your job. And, and, uh, and, you know, I can understand that because, because you know, you know, today, uh, politics, and, and, it, and it's, it, it's, it's gotten, you know, um, I don't know if worse is the, is the way to go, but, you know, I call it in-your-face politics, where people want to get in your face and they want to, you know, express themselves in a very emotional manner a lot of times. And, uh, and sometimes that can be difficult. But, but, uh, uh, but the great majority of people are, are very respectful, and the great majority of people just want to be heard. And, 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 you know, and talking earlier in, in the introduction about listening is really, if you really just have to listen to people, let them get it off their chest. And then, um, you know, my philosophy has always been that I'm not here, uh, and my staff has heard me say this a few times, I'm not here to convince you that what we do in Plainville or any other town is, is right. I'm not, I'm not here to explain I'm not here to convince people that uh, what we do is the right way to do things. My job is to explain to you why we do the things we do. And if you understand why we do the things we do, then I've accomplished my job. If somebody walks out of my office and says, you know, I don't agree with them, but I understand why they're doing it, then, you know, that's really uh, – where I want to go with people, and 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 and, uh, and most people don't want to be convinced that that uh, you know you're right, and 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 I'm wrong, or vice versa. They just want to understand why, and and I think that's uh, one way to be successful. I do, uh, um, I do want to encourage everyone here today, and that includes professors as well uh, and staff, to to consider being a volunteer uh, in uh, in their community. Uh, the qualifications are fairly simple, time and common sense. That's all you need, time and common sense. And, uh, and, and, and usually the common sense part is the tougher one to, uh, to overcome. Uh, and and uh, let me tell you why, uh, let me tell you a little bit about volunteerism in towns. One, number one is there is a need. There is a need. In Plainville, for example, and it's probably, I know it's the same in most communities, there are boards and commissions that there are just numerous uh, openings. And we're crying for people uh, to, to, to come and volunteer. Uh, so there is a need. It's a relatively little time, com time commitment. Most of the time, these, these boards and commissions might meet once or twice a month, maybe a little bit more often if they're in the middle of a, a project. But m most of the time, it's, it's, it's once or twice a month. You'll learn a, lot about, uh, you'll learn a lot about your community. You think you know a lot about your community? 
until you start getting on a board of commission. You'll learn a lot about your town. Uh, you will pick up knowledge and skills that can benefit you in your career. Things like uh, working with others, dealing with people, solving problems, to name a few, uh, specific knowledge depending upon the border, the border commission. So there's, there's skills that you can pick up, experiences that you can pick up being on a border commission that's gonna help you in life. Uh, you get to meet new people, people that you might not otherwise meet. Uh, you make connections. And, I, and don't underestimate the making connections. As you meet new people, you, they get to know you, you get to know them, uh, depending upon you know, what you're looking to do, uh, what, you know, what, what your aspirations might be. There may be a connection there that, 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 uh, that, uh, that affords you opportunities as well. And I know many people have made connections in their volunteer efforts that have, that have greatly helped them going forward in their, in their careers and in their life. Uh, you learn how to work with people that have differing opinions. Sometimes we like to surround ourselves with people that uh, we agree with all the time, and that's, that's not necessarily a, you know, a good thing in, in, terms of, in terms of personal growth. Uh, and, and, and I want to underestimate this next one as well. It is fun, it can be fun, and it is rewarding. Uh, and finally, you can make a difference. You can make this, you, you can participate in making your community or whatever, you know, your board of commission that you may participate in, um, you can make a difference in your community, uh, a very significant difference. And let me talk about some of the uh, uh, examples of the boards and commissions in Plainville. Every town's a little bit different. They don't have the same uh, boards and commissions necessarily. Uh, and uh, uh, so if you're in, you know, uh, so I'll, I'll just show you what some of the breadth of examples are in Plainville, and, and I'm sure there's, there's similar ones in your community as well. Number one in, in Plainville, it's not number one, but the first one on my list, of course, is because it starts with an A, is we have an aviation commission. Because the town of Plainville owns an airport, we have an aviation commission that manages, that, that manages and oversees that airport. That's kind of a unique uh, uh, area. There's not, you know, not too many municipally owned airports, but you know, we have volunteers who come in and, and learn about, uh, you know, they manage the airport, they oversee it, they make decisions with respect to it, and, uh, uh, and, and, and it's generally people who have aviation interest, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And, and so uh, that's something that's unique, and it's something that could be fun, and it's something that at least some people find interesting. We have what we call a board of assessment appeals. Their taxes are based upon the value of your property. The value of your property is set by the, by the assessor in the community. But if you're not happy with that value, if you think that it's somehow that assessor made a mistake, you can appeal to what they call the Board of Assessment Appeals. And the Board of Assessment Appeals, what they do is they hear, the residents come in and talk to them and say, you know, they say my house is worth 250000 I think it's only worth, you know, 200000 And they have a conversation and they say, well, why do you feel that way? And, and these are your residents. These are your neighbors. And you talk and you have a conversation and depending upon, you know, the evidence that you give to them, they'll change your assessment. So you have the opportunity to, to, to you know, to, you know, you know, it isn't the, the big bad town workers that make the final decision. If you're not happy with that decision, you can appeal it to your, to your fellow residents that, who are volunteers who sit on a board and, you know, and, 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 uh, and make those types of decisions that impact people individually. Uh, we have what we call a capital projects building committee in our town. Any large projects that get constructed, we have a capital projects building committee that oversees it, which means that they advertise for the contractors. They, they make decisions on who the architects are going to be, who the construction managers are going to be, whether you know what the change orders are. And these are these are in Plainville. We have a couple of projects that are going on right now. We have a school building project that's a, a 22 million dollar project that this capital projects building committee is overseeing. We have a water pollution control authority uh, a construction project that's uh, 15 million dollars that's being constructed right now. Uh, we, you know, we have other road projects, a $5 million road project that's going on. And this committee oversees that and makes decisions with respect to it. These are people, citizens, volunteers who, who, are, who are doing that. Certainly we guide them, we give them advice, but they're the decision makers by and large. We have a uh, Connecticut, uh, Central Connecticut Tourism District for those people who, who want to talk about tourism opportunities. There's, there's opportunities to volunteer to serve on that. We have a conservation commission that uh, Oversees you know river cleanups and, and and fishing derbies and 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 things to do with you know the betterment the betterment of uh, you know the conservation of land. 
We have the Economic Development Commission who, who uh, makes recommendations with regards to businesses and, and how we can improve the economic climate in our community. Uh, we have volunteer firefighters. We, we don't have a professional firefighting, uh, 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 we don't have professional firefighters, we have volunteers. And if we didn't have volunteers, it would probably cost us millions of dollars to hire firefighters. And I, and I would say that our volunteer fire department in, in Plainville is, is, is pretty much second to none. And, and, uh, and the, these are people who come out in the middle of the night or, or any time during the day when there's problems and it doesn't necessarily mean it's a fire. Uh, you know, and, 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 and they're very critical to our community. Uh, and you can learn to be a firefighter and, and, and get a lot of satisfaction with helping other people. We have a housing authority that looks that oversees uh, you know elderly housing. We have Inland Wetlands Commission that talks about in, you know the, you know, uh, you know ponds and streams and whatnot. Uh, we have an insurance commission that that gives recommendations on the types of insurances that the town should should purchase. We have a land acquisition committee for those you know for, to make recommendations on purchasing of open space. We have an ethics commission that if somebody feels that somebody's not acting in an ethical manner, they can, they, they can fill out a, a complaint about someone, and we have a commission that actually looks at that and, and makes recommendations. We have a planning and zoning commission, which is probably the more, probably one of the most important commissions in the community, which oversees the development of a town and decides and, and, and sets the rules for development. Uh, we have a parks and recreation commission that determines the programs in your community. and, and uh, uh, and oversees the parks. We have a recycling of solid waste for those who want to get involved with, you know, recycling or, or, or trash issues, which, you know, we, we sometimes take for granted. We have a committee on aging that makes recommendations with regards to elderly citizens in our community. We have a veterans council that talks about, that helps veterans out uh, and, and directs them uh, where, they, where they can get some help. We have a zoning board of appeals who wasn't happy with the zoning issues that the, the, the rules of the Planning and Zoning Commission say, well, my particular property has something unique to it, so I, I don't think I should be bound by the rules. We have a Zoning Board of Appeals that decides whether you, you have a unique enough uh, situation to make those changes. So all of these things that I've named, which is, I don't know, 15 or 20, uh, they're all, they're all uh, diverse. They're all uh, manned by volunteers, and they all are critical to the operation of, of, of local communities, and we wouldn't be able to do the job that we need to do without having uh, people uh, serving and volunteering on these, on these boards and commissions. Uh, we also have elected people who, who you know, uh, the, what I talked about was, you know, these, these don't run for office. You, you, you come in, you say, hey, I, I'm interested in serving on this board or commission, and, and, you, and you know, in our town, you fill out an application you may have to be interviewed by me if I'm the appointing authority. A lot of times the appointing authority is the town council. And I can tell you that uh, we don't have people knocking on the doors. So if you're interested in serving, and I'm sure it's the same in other communities, if you're, if you're interested in serving on the Aviation Commission, you walk in the door, you could be going to a meeting next week as an appointed member of the Aviation Commission. So it's not very hard to, to get involved. And, 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 uh, and, and I would, you know, I wouldn't hesitate because you think, well, well, they might not choose me. Again, if, if you just come in and you, and you have the time and you appear to have common sense at that particular period of time and not an ax to grind, then there's a pretty good chance you'll get appointed to a board or commission of you know, pretty much of your choosing, although something like planning and zoning might take a little bit longer, but they have what they call alternates. An alternate is, is they'll appoint you. You're not, you know, you're not necessarily seated. We, let's say it's a, it's a seven-member planning and zoning commission. They have three alternates. Quorum, you know, if there's, a, if there's a Planning and Zoning Commission member that cannot make that meeting, so they only have six people, they'll, they'll seat an alternate, and the alternate will, will actually have a chance to vote. But the alternates, what happens is, they, is they, they learn on the job, so to speak. So when an opening happens on a Planning and Zoning Commission, they generally move an alternate into that position. So even if there isn't an opening as a regular member, consider it being, as, you know, an alternate. Uh, but then we have our elected uh, uh, people, and... Uh, you know, we have, we have a town council, we have a seven member town council that's elected. And you say, wow, you know, what does it take to, you know, uh, you know how, do you, how do you get on a town council? We, we you know, and, and it, you know, you get involved in the politics, you, you get into a party and, you know, Democrat, Republican, independent, you know, unaffiliated, you know, whatever. Um, and you say, well, you know, what type of experience do I need to, to, to be the elected leader of the town. Well, you know, the people aren't knocking on the door to be the town council to be on the town council either. In fact, we have a we have a person who's who's 23 years old, 
Went to Tuxus Community College. I'm not sure if he still goes to Tuxus, or, is it, or is it, whether he's at Central, you would know. But uh, he was elected to the town council. He's 20, 20, 22 years old, 23 years old. He graduated with my son in high school. So, so uh, and, and this is his first time participating on a board of commission. And, you know, he, you know some, the, the one political party was, was looking for somebody. That, you know, he, ha he has a name that some people know, but he was an unknown. And he's a young person that is now one of the seven elected people, one of seven you know, sitting in the, you know, the highest elected position in, in the community. I have to deal with him, you know, and he really doesn't know too much. But, but he's very respectful, and, you know, he listens, and, he, and he's learning, and, he, and, he, and he's very much enjoying, you know, being on the town council. Uh, I get a little nervous when we get people who get on the town council that really have zero experience to begin with, but, uh, you know, but I have a little bit of experience in handling that as well. We have a board of education that's elected. These are people who, who make decisions with regards to, you know, you know pr pretty much pre-K through, through high school, decisions on, on how the school uh, will run the type of programs that they will give and, and have a, you know, a very significant impact on everybody who goes through the school system. Uh, we have a registrar of voters who's responsible for maintaining the voters list. We have a library board of trustees which oversees our library. We have constables who, you know, they're not police officers. Constables are pretty much people who, 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 uh, uh, they pretty much deliver uh, notices and whatnot nowadays. And we have justices of the peace who marry people, pretty much. So, um, uh, but in terms of other types of civic engagement, and this is you know this uh, this is a little bit outside of you know towns, but there are many clubs and organizations that raise money for charity, and and I would encourage you to look into that as well. For example, they're looking for members. I'm talking about uh, people, you know, volunteer organizations like the Lions Club, the Rotary Club, uh, the Elks Club. Uh, and there's, there's many others out there who, who, uh, who basically are organizations that raise money for various, for various purposes, <coughs> charitable purposes. Uh, I was a member of the, uh, I, when I was in Hebron, I joined the Hebron Lions Club. The Hebron Lions Club puts on the Hebron Harvest Fair. Has anybody been to the Hebron Harvest Fair ever? It's the third largest agricultural fair in the state of Connecticut. It's, it's, in, uh, it's in September. Uh, and I started off, you know, just as a lowly member. I said, I, I'm, the t I'm the town manager of the town, but I'm just joining the club because I want to give back to my community. You know, just tell me what to do. I tell people what to do pretty much every day, so just tell me what to do. And, uh, and I can tell you that uh, uh, the fair, I was, I was a member of the, the club for 23 years. Even when I moved to Plainville, I stayed in the Hebron Lions Club. And, uh, and it, it's a year-round process of, of, uh, of planning uh, this, this fair. We, we, uh, we had about 150,000 people that would show up four days at a fair. We, our, our budget was, you know, 700000 to a million dollars. We raised, uh, you know, probably on a, on a good year, maybe three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 that we gave back to our community. It made a big difference, big difference in Hebron and uh, made a big difference to the whole area. And, uh, and it was fun, and it was fun. So, so there's, there's other, if you, you know, it, you know, here in, you know, locally, you have the Mum Festival, you have the Apple Harvest Festival in Southington, and getting involved with those organizations, I can tell you, is very rewarding and very, uh, I keep going back to fun. And, and you learn, you meet people, and all the other things that I spoke about earlier. Uh, as far as, as far as, uh, a career is concerned. If you're thinking about getting involved, perhaps you know, uh, you know, as, as a career in government, local government, there are opportunities. Uh, people like myself are getting older. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of people in the municipal center that have gray hair, such as like mine, and they, you know, and and, and very soon there there will be openings, and and, and there are openings today. Uh, working in local government. You help uh, make other people's lives better. It's a steady employment. Uh, relatively decent pay and, and benefits, relatively. Uh, you can, again, you can see things from beginning to end. There's continuous training opportunities. Uh, there's a great variety of work. Uh, and I think that's very important. You know, pretty much uh, in my office and in many other offices, you're not doing the same thing every day. You're, you're, you're facing a new challenge either every day or every week or, or even multiple times during the day. 
And I think that keeps you vibrant. I think that keeps you on your toes. And I think it, it, it makes the days go a lot faster. I can tell you that we come in at, you know, at 8 o'clock, and, and many times we look up at the clock, and, and we, our clock is supposed to, we, we're supposed to be able to go home at 4 o'clock. And, and as many times people in my office look up at the clock, and it's 5 o'clock. And, 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 and then we're like, ooh, maybe we should go home and, and go back tomorrow. But it's not because we're staring at the clock all day. It's because the time goes fast. And I think that that's uh, uh, it's important to me, and I think it's important to uh, people that work in local government to, to have things go, you know, to not be looking at the clock all day. Uh, working in local government, you will acquire skills that are very much valued in the private sector, uh, you know, should you choose to change careers at some point in time. And, uh, and again, I think it's a very rewarding uh, career. Give you some examples of, of, of the diversity of people who work in, in, in local government. You know, I heard somebody earlier said, talked about, uh, you know, be, becoming a teacher. Uh, you know, police officers, we, we, you know, believe it or not, we, we have a hard time finding good candidates to be police officers. Our police officers, it's not about handing out tickets necessarily. It's not about, uh, you know, fighting crime. It's, it, it, you know, our, our police officers are also the first responders. When you die on 911, you have a medical emergency, the police officer is going to show up first, and he's going to help, help you until the ambulance is, it, it, you know, uh, gets there. And I can tell you that there's, it, that's a very uh, critical uh, service that we provide, and, it's, and, and I know that uh, uh, our police officers get to meet people, help people, and I know that that's something that keeps them going day in and day out from all the bad things that they may say. Uh, we have finance department for finances for, for, for uh, those people who are math orientated. We have uh, uh, information technology uh, for those who, who, who want to work with computers. We have, you know, library services. We run a library, parks and recreation, public works, building inspectors, uh, water pollution control authority. We take for granted when we flush the toilet, you know, that, that it disappears and it goes somewhere. But there's, there's a whole group of people that are, that are waiting down at the wastewater treatment plant to to uh, you know, make sure that that water is clean enough before it goes into the river. There's certifications that people have to get to, to, to perform these duties. And, they, and for those people who have been involved, and if you follow through on something like that, you know, if you're into chemistry, biology, those, those types of things, if you get the certifications and the training, you're pretty much writing your own ticket because people are, 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 are clamoring or are really in demand. And, uh, and uh, you can make a significant amount of dollars if you, if you look into a career uh, in something as simple as water pollution control. Uh, we have town planners, economic people in economic development, things, in, uh, th things doing with computers and geographic information systems and whatnot. Uh, I'm going to stop right here for a second and just uh, uh, ask Scott. And, and I, I brought Scott here today because he's, he's maybe a little bit closer to some people in you know, you're, you're the age of the people in this, in, in this uh, room right now. And, and I wanted to uh, ask him to give a little bit of, of his experience and how he, how he got involved in local government. And, uh, and it wasn't the traditional uh, route either. So, uh, so Scott, why don't you come up and maybe say a few words? You guys are pretty quiet, so uh, that's OK. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hopefully, everybody's awake. Um, so I started. Uh, community college as well, up in Massachusetts. I went to Holyoke Community College, uh, but I thought I wanted to be uh, someone that worked in law enforcement, so I went in uh, for criminal justice. And I kept that dream going all the way through my undergrad. Uh, I transitioned and went up to Westfield State University in Westfield, Massachusetts. Uh, I got my bachelor's in criminal justice up there, and by that point in time, I had already been a security manager for a company for about seven years, and I was looking to go back for my graduate degree, uh, and I went, instead of the Master's of Criminal Justice, I took the uh, Master's in Public Administration with a criminal justice track. Uh, but while I was there, I ended up learning a little bit more about local government and wanted to kind of see what that was like firsthand. So I looked for internships uh, all around, and it was very hard to find them, you know, at the time for me. Um, but was lucky enough to find an internship in Plainville. Um, so I sat in an interview with Robert, um, and he took me on as a town manager intern, uh, in which I did for a about a year. Um, and this is actually next week. I'll have been with Plainville for three years already, as, and I don't know where time goes. Um, but was lucky enough to uh, be offered a full-time position about two years ago um, as the assistant to the town manager. So some of the things that I do 
uh, is working with the Public Works Department with some of the administrative tasks, as well as helping out uh, the Finance Department in the preparation of the town budget. And I'll, with that, there are a bunch of other things. Like Robert mentioned, you know, no, no day is the same. You always have different tasks uh, or challenges that arise that you have to step in and, and work on. Um, but I really love what I do. And it, it is fun, you know, as Robert mentioned. I, I think it's, it's great to be able to help other people. Um, but being able to solve problems uh, in a, a variety of different ways um, is a great thing. And you also get to, you know, help make a difference, which is the one thing I wanted to do, which is why I wanted to go with criminal justice. But I can actually provide uh, this on a larger scale. Um, so I really do you know, admire this field and, and definitely recommend those who are interested to really kind of get their foot in the door and, and, and look for those internships because that's, that's the big thing is, is uh, networking with some of the other uh, officials who work for the towns and cities here in Connecticut or any of the other states. Um, and what I do right now is, you know, I'm able to go through a lot of trainings and seminars to kind of boost my professional development so that one day I could, you know, be an assistant uh, town or city manager and, and work my way up to be a town or city manager myself, uh, which is still a, a little ways off for me. I still have a lot of learning to do. Um, but there are a lot of different unique opportunities and associations that you can learn from. Uh, one of them is ICMA, which is the International uh, City Management Association. And they provide a lot of articles uh, in regards to local government challenges that individuals face all across the country and the world. Uh, but they also offer career advice for individuals looking to enter the field, which I think is very unique. You can reach out to other individuals um, who you can you know, be coached from or you can coach. So if you have any unique questions that you are interested in and you want to ask someone in a different community or in a larger city, you're able to find that individual, reach out to them, and uh, they're able to help you. Um, they also provide um, postings for jobs and internships all across the country. Uh, and then we also have um, a small state chapter, the Connecticut Town uh, and Managers uh, Management Association. And they meet monthly, and it's all the town managers and assistants and any other students or interns. Um, are able to get together and kind of just talk about what they're going through and overcome any challenges along the way. Uh, but it's also a great networking opportunity for those interested in the field. Um, but they also provide a lot of uh, valuable information um, for those who are interested. Um, so for, for the most part, I definitely would recommend, um, if you're kind of unsure, if you really do think that this is something you want to do, uh, to definitely pursue it. Um, I, you definitely won't, you won't regret it. It would be a great opportunity. Um, and if you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to um, ask me at the end of this meeting, or I can leave an email address. Um, but other than that, I will turn this back over to Robert. We were fortunate enough in Plainville that we actually pay our interns, so that, that makes it a little bit more attractive for people to, to come here and, 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 and actually allows them to you know, make some money while they're, while they're learning on the job. Uh, Plainville has had an internship program, a paid internship program for a lot of years now, and, and, and I have a list here, and I just want to give you an idea of the interns, you know, so many interns that we've had and where they are today. We have one who is currently serves as the executive director of the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority that was in Plainville way back when. We have a person who now is the C chief executive officer of Food Share. We have somebody who is, is currently the, the budget director of, of Manchester. Uh, we have uh, a person who is now the budget analysis, analysis, uh, budget analysis for the town of Vernon, but he was uh, uh, assistant town manager in Burlington, in Burlington, Vermont. We have somebody who was a claims adjuster, uh, but he did serve on the town council in Newington as well after he left us. Um, we have somebody who is who was the administrative assistant to the vice president of human uh, resources and the executive associate to the president of Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac University. Uh, we have somebody who's a property manager. Uh, we have somebody who's an administrative analysis, analyst for the town of Mansfield. We have a person who's now the economic development coordinator for the town of East Hartford. We have somebody who's an executive assistant for the town of Farmington. And we have Scott here. So you can see that people that have that started, you know, as an intern in, in, in Plainville 
you know, have gone on to bigger and better things in, in, in many other communities as well. And, and I think we're very proud of the fact that we've been able to, uh, uh, you know, train people, give them the experience that they need to go on to, uh, you know, a career that will be rewarding and, and, and beneficial to them and to other people as well. Uh, you know, there are many people in my generation who feel that uh, young adults today are self-centered, don't care about others, and want everything handed to them. Uh, they use as examples the fact that younger people are not participating in efforts to, to improve their community, their lower tendency to vote. They see them always staring at their phones. And then what appears to be a lack of interest in volunteerism. Uh, I, I have a son who's uh, turning 23 this Saturday. And uh, I've witnessed uh, the growth of him and, and his friends. And, and met many of his friends, both in high school and college. And I have a very different perspective regarding the younger generation. Uh, I feel very confident that your generation will step up to be a very positive force in future years. Uh, but I, I, I believe that those, that those who have come here today and people in your generation have something that's, a, that's a, probably the most valuable commodity in the world, and that is the gift of being young. Uh, many people do not understand uh, the, how valuable this is until they get to be my age. And uh, my advice is don't waste this uh, precious gift. Uh, there are many opportunities in this world for you to get involved and make a difference. Civic engagement is one way to make a difference. It will help you grow, help others grow, and have fun doing it. I hope to, I've given you some things to think about today and hopefully inspired you a little bit to consider getting involved in your community, whether as a volunteer or to pursue a career in local government. Uh, I can honestly say that I've enjoyed my work over the years, and I'm glad that I chose this as a career path and made a positive uh, contribution to my community and to others. Uh, and I would encourage you to consider especially on the volunteer side, getting civically engaged in your community. Uh, I read something today as I was coming here, and it's a, a program that's going to happen on December 1st up at the Hartford Public Library. It's called Renewing Our Civic Culture, and it's put on by the Connecticut Civic Ambassadors uh, Group. I have some information on the back table. If you're interested, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a group that, uh, who believe in engaging Others in community and public life strengthen, uh, strengthens our state's civic health and promotes community well-being. And uh, I guess there's going to be a group discussion about that in Hartford on December 1st. So for, the, for those of you who might be interested in, in, in learning a little bit more about how to get involved, uh, you know, that's another opportunity as well. So uh, I thank you for listening to me today, to listening to us today, this morning. Uh, and if anybody has any questions or comments that they'd like to make, I, I certainly would would try to answer them and uh what we'll do is well if anyone has questions we'll pass around the microphone so that we can all hear what the question is so i don't know if anyone would like to start alex or... uh so i was wondering I'm going in to be a teacher, and I was wondering if uh, getting a position as a volunteer on the Board of Education, would that look very good on a resume, so to say, or help pursue my career a bit more? Well, if, if, you're, if you're asked to be on the Board of Education, it's an elected position, number one. Oh, okay. You know, so that's, you know, that, that's not an appointed position. Oh, okay. So, so that might, you know, uh, uh, certainly if you're involved, and you're familiar with, with uh, uh, let's say, the process, and, and you're on a board of education, it may not be good for the town that you live in, but it probably it would be very valuable for other, you know, for other communities to, to, have, to consider somebody. And I think it would give you a leg up in other communities if you were on a board of education and, and were familiar with the, with the process, yes. Thank you. 
Uh, there are a lot of internship opportunities available at the teacher's level. Uh, hopefully you're, you're somewhat familiar with those and, and take advantage of those as well. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your presentation today. Um, I, I was listening to all the different commissions and councils you have, but I didn't hear anything about health. Are you part of a health district? And we are. How we does are. that? Can you talk about that a little bit? We have a in, in Plainville. We're we're part of the Plainville Southington Health District, which is which is uh, managed by a board of health. I was part of the uh, discussions with Southington when we formed that about six or seven years ago. Uh, it's a seven-member board of health. Uh, we are responsible for you know. Uh, a lot of you know, seven different areas of health that, that the state uh, mandates that towns uh, uh, be involved with. Uh, when I formed, when I was negotiating with the town of Southington about, you know, having a board of health, there's five members from Southington, two members from Plainville. I, I, it was my recommendation that the, that the town managers of each town at least be one of the members of the board of health. We have a volunteer from Plainville who's appointed, and there and there's four other. Uh, volunteers from Southington that are, that, are, that are involved with the Board of Health. We meet probably six times a year. We have a staff uh, of, of six people that, uh, that do a lot of health services in the community. So yes, there are, there are, there are opportunities to serve on the Board of Health as well. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first is a simple one. Who's the student from Tunxis, who went on to, uh, uh, I think he went to UConn, and you mentioned him earlier. He worked with the town. Uh, his name is Ty Cox. You mentioned him to me before. Does anyone know him? He's 23 now, or okay. Hmm. We must have missed him somehow. But but he was here as a student for a couple of years. Yeah. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I just Tuxus or Central. So I, okay. I, I, I recall him saying that he was in Tuxus. So. I'm sure he was. Yeah, interesting. The second question is this: a, a lot of he works for Stanley Works now. So oh, does he? He's going into manufacturing. So. Wow, interesting. <laughs> a lot of students think that local governments and, and towns, the way they function, they function in a vacuum. But clearly, you're reliant on the state of Connecticut for a lot of what you do, a lot of the resources that you get. Could you just explain that a little, just delineate how reliant upon the state you are for your services? Well, to, well you know, uh, first off, towns, you know, communities, municipalities, we, we just can't operate uh, any way we want to. We have to follow, you know, statutes. You know the laws of the state of Connecticut. They they basically dictate, you know, uh, what we can, and, and in many instances, what we can't do. You know, we, we can't make you know, you know for example, uh, I can't set a speed limit on a local road without getting state traffic, you know, approval. You know, we can't decide that you know certain things. So, uh, uh, and and that and that permeates just about you know land use, just about anything that we do, we have to follow. You know the statutes that have been involved. We we do we do have some independence, but 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 uh, there are there are reins on us. But but in a lot of instances, especially in the area of education, we it, we have men man, what they call mandates that we have to do certain things. A lot of times you'll hear uh, unfunded mandates. What that means is the state legislature decides that the town should be doing something, providing some type of service or going you know you know doing something in particular that they think is good for the state. But guess what? We're not going to pay for it. We're going to make you pay for it, which is kind of frustrating to somebody at my level because it's like if you think this is important and you think this is something that should be done, you should be willing to pay for it. It's very easy to say, hey, you need to do this, and oh, by the way, you have to pay for it, and, uh, which is you know, somewhat frustrating, to, to, again, to somebody in my position. But you know, in Plainville, uh, our budget, we, we, we run a $60 million budget. About 36 million of that is, is education. The rest is, is, is the town. Uh, we get from the state of Connecticut somewhere around 12 million dollars a year for, for you know from from the state for to support you know uh, our budget and uh, and and how that fluctuates can impact you know local taxes as well. So when you hear somebody at the you know that says you know we're going to eliminate the you know, we're going to eliminate, and I'm not going to mention names, I'm just going to say we're talking about eliminating the state income tax. That money's got to come, the money that that raises goes somewhere. It probably goes to municipalities. And what you get nervous about is, okay, if you're going to, 
you know, eliminate the, the, the income tax, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to, you know, you're either going to cut services dramatically or you're going to have to raise property taxes because it's got to come from somewhere. So, so what happens at the state level impacts, can impact at the municipal level on a, on a fairly, you know, direct basis in terms of, you know, the cost to municipalities and whatnot. So uh, uh, we're, we're heavily dependent in Connecticut on, 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 under the statutes, what we can and cannot do, and especially from a monetary uh, point of view as well. Um, you just said that uh, the money has to come from somewhere. What about uh, cutting unnecessary spending? And you mentioned the roads earlier, and I was just wondering uh, how, how the, re like the odd restructuring on Metacomet Road happened there with like the speed bumps and like their redoing of like the stop signs there. And that's, you know, and that's getting involved, you know, uh, that's one of the, again, getting involved in the community. Uh, we have an area in our town where, a residential area where uh, people, you know, complain about uh, the fact that they're speeding on their road and that's, that it's dangerous. And uh, first off, the, the, the second uh, most common complaint I get, other than taxes are too high, is speeding on local roads. So, you know, people always complain about speeding, and when we go out there and we check it, it's usually your neighbors that are speeding, if not you yourself, but, and, you know, putting that aside. Uh, well, you know, we, we just don't go out and do things, you know, and say, okay, how, how do we stop something like that? We can do a little bit of enforcement with the police, but that's only a temporary kind of thing. So what I did in this particular instance, you know, is, is, is I got a community group, you know, I asked all the neighbors to get together. We had several meetings at the municipal center and talked about it. And uh, we also did some analysis of, of how fast people are going because a lot of times you might think, boy, that guy's doing 60 miles an hour, but there's a radar on it, the person's only doing 35 miles an hour. It only looks fast, but it isn't as fast as you might think it is. So we do some actually, you know, some, some analysis to see how fast people are actually going. And depending upon, you know, uh, the discussions with the residents in the neighborhood, the analysis of, of how fast people are really going, what is, you know, we make decisions on, you know, how can we slow people down if we can at all. There's certain roads that, that, that certain traffic calming devices are, you know, make sense. There's others where it doesn't make a lot of sense. In this particular instance, I'm the local of traffic. Although I'm the town manager, I'm also what they call the local traffic authority. So I make decisions with regards to roads within certain parameters, within certain rules. I made the determination after talking with the neighbors, after looking at the, at the, uh, uh, after looking at the results of, of, of the speed, you know, speeding information, after consulting with the police, after consulting with the engineering department, we put up what we call temporary speed bumps. And we put them up for a year, and we, you know, we, we, we took a look at the speed, we saw what those impacts were, and we saw that, hey, we slowed people down. And, 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 and people in the neighborhood, not everybody, not 100%, I can tell you that, but in my opinion, the people that I've received feedback, the great majority of the people said, hey, it was effective, and we'd like to, you know, we, we're very, we're happy with them because it's doing what it needs to be done. But there are residual impacts. The impacts is, there's, you know, you've got to go over speed bumps. It makes noise, it could be, you know. But, it, but they determined, and I determined, that it was more important to slow people down than it was to live with speed bumps. And, uh, and so we, we, don't, we won't put them up everywhere. We, you know, it's, it, it's, unfortunately, it's a trend where people aren't, people aren't following the rules as, as it relates to, to, to driving their cars. So. Uh, so it's a process, and it was a process that probably took about a year and a half, and we didn't do it in a vacuum. Uh, but I can tell you that, uh, at least in my opinion, a lot of people in the area are happy with it. You're not. You're not, I can tell, maybe? Uh, I was just wondering how that came about. How it all came about. Did you ever attend any of the meetings by any chance? Or? Uh, no. Okay. No, I, work, I work in Windows, so okay. I go through there a lot. Yeah, we just installed some speed bumps on Betsy Road as well, so. That's, a, that's been a cut through, and, and those people are very happy with it. And I can tell you my public works isn't happy with it because they got to plow the roads, and they think that it's going to be a pain to plow over the speed bumps. But it, unfortunately, you know, somebody says to me, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have, you know, people say to me all the time, I wouldn't have made that decision, you know. And I say to them, you know, or, or I think you're wrong in making that decision. Sometimes people's people have opinion about what we do, but they don't have to live with the consequences if something happens as a result of it. You know, they, they could say, well, I don't think it's good to put speed bumps on Metacomet. But if I'm aware that people are speeding on that road and I'm not doing something about it, you know, 
then, then if somebody gets hurt, I feel somewhat responsible for it. Now, you know, we have the idiots, the idiot that does 60 miles an hour down the road and hits a little kid. I, I, you know, we can't do anything about the idiots, but we can, we can do something about you know, people's tendency to drive faster just because they feel more comfortable on a road. And, and to put up speed bumps, for example, makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable and slows them down and makes the area safer. You know, again, I'm responsible for the decisions that are made in, in, in certain areas. And, 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 and sometimes when people say to me, hey, I don't think you should have done that, say, well, you got to put yourself in my, in my position and understand that I have a responsibility to, 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 to take care of certain things. It's not an easy decision all the time. Sometimes uh, just residents and just average people who are not into politics, they don't understand that politics is, is a, a game of trade-offs. And, and oftentimes you don't see the unintended consequences of, of policies and, 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 or of not putting into place the policy. And that's the kind of thing that, that we try to instruct young people on in, in state and local government. So that trade-offs issue is the big one. Okay, um, one comment on the, the speed bumps thing is um, as a delivery driver, um, I noticed that as soon as speed bumps were, temporary speed bumps were removed in one area that I go through a lot, people speed up, like as, as soon as they're gone. I know that I personally start resuming the normal speed or I start using that route again because it's shorter. Um, but the other thing I had a question on was um, how does state legislator, le legislature differ um, in terms of so if the state of Connecticut wants to form a law, do they look from input from each of the towns? I probably should know this being in your class. Well, it depends. You know, it, it depends. You know, a, a lot of times there's, there's groups that lobby the state legislature or certain, okay. you know, committees, and, and they have a lot of influence about, uh, about making, making laws okay, that, so that impact local communities. Lobbying groups. Yeah. And uh, we, we have... Uh, you know, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, which is a, a lobbying group for, for municipalities. We have the Council of Small Towns, which is, you know, uh, another lobbying group of, of, of small towns, and I'm involved with both of them. Uh, we have the Capital Region Council of Governments, which is a regional organization that, that, that does some lobbying, and we, we try as much as possible as we see statutes being considered that we try to give our input. And, and, and we actually make suggestions, but you know, we're somewhat frustrated in the fact, and, and I've been involved in you know, government, local Connecticut government for a long time. You would think that if they were thinking of doing something that they would call us up and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or, you know, but they don't. And, and a lot of times we, there's unintended consequences in a very negative fashion that we have to deal with. To amend the law, to amend the law, for example, to change it. Not necessarily. I would start by talking to your local legislator. Okay. Talk to your local legislator and say, "Hey, you know, tell me a little bit about this." Okay. At some point in time, you you end up. They have committees up at the up at the state capitol, and, and, and you know, find out why the, why the law was implemented. You know, who, who, who pushed it, you know, who might have been against it. You know, do, a little, do a little homework on it, and then uh, that might give you some direction as far as how you might go about changing it. It's not easy, but it, but it can be done. It can be done. And sometimes uh, it, it may be something that CCM or the Council of Small Towns is, is, is also in favor of changing it as well, so you, st you start to build a coalition. <coughs> a lot of it is understanding why, and, and a lot of times when people understand why, they may say, well, I don't like it, but I understand why, so, I, you know, and sometimes that makes you feel better that, yeah. well, I guess it makes sense. Are there other questions for either Mr. Lee or Mr. Golding? I, I would just suggest that, you know, if you, if you have any questions after you leave or, or, or you sit, you, you know, or you want to have a you know, further conversation, we talked about the open door policy. It is open door. Uh, you, you, can find me, you can find me on email. Just go to Town of Playville. It's pretty easy to get a hold of me or, or give me a call. And if you just want to sit down and have a conversation, if you're thinking about being a police officer, we have a police chief that will sit down and have a conversation with you at any time and, and talk about that career. We have, if you wanted to go into the health field, you know, I, I could have you sit down with our health director. 
Uh, again, there's internships, and in, you know, if you're thinking about the library, almost anything that, that, that you might be interested in, uh, you know, don't, don't hesitate to call, because I believe it's important to get the, the younger generation involved early on. I got involved early on, and, and uh, uh, there's opportunities out there, and, and I'm willing to help you learn about those opportunities. I don't care what town you live in. Doesn't matter to me where you live. Scott was from Massachusetts at the time when he came down. So, uh, and many of our interns were from from out of town or if not out of state. So, uh, don't say, "Well, I, I'll go in and you know talk to somebody," uh, you know, in my hometown. You know, it may it may be a little bit more difficult. So, just a just a open door invitation. So, all right. Well, I would like to thank our guests for being here today. We should all give them a round of applause because that was great. couple things that occurred to me before we end the program. Uh, I think Scott is uh, a perfect illustration of how there doesn't exactly need to be so much pressure on you finding your career and your straight line trajectory right away. As long as you keep an open mind and don't be too concerned about the pressures of getting to where you need to be at age 22. I think you'll be okay, and you should always follow your passions, and you never know where those passions are going to lead, and I think he could be the first to vouch for that. And you're in exactly that position he, he may have been in a couple of years, a few years ago. You seem so young to me, but, but you, you've told me about years of experience. Like 28, or 27. Okay. I age <laughs> you age yourself. So anyway, let, let his example be a lesson for all of you. I think that's crucially important to young people, and we try to communicate that to you all the time through advising and teaching. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, secondly, uh, I hope you saw the title of, of the program, that's not what your town can do for you, but what you can do for your town. That's a play on what? I hope many of you know what that's a play on what, Alex? I put them on the spot. Who knows what that is in reference to faith? And who said that? No, no. Who? JFK. John F. Kennedy is in his inaugural address. And, and so he called for a nation of self-sacrifice. But I believe if that kind of self-sacrifice is done at the local level, it's so much more powerful. And, and it can be so much more life-changing, not only for individuals, but for communities across the country. And that's why we named today's discussion that. There was a, a specific reason for it. So again, I, I'd like to thank our guests. I hope they can come back sometime. We certainly would, would welcome them back. And, and I just thought it was a very interesting perspective on, on town leadership and some of the roles that you can possibly play through volunteerism or through internships. Uh, he mentioned their paid internships, too. That, that might, that might uh, inspire some of you. So again, thank you to you both. And, and uh, uh, there's still some food in the back. Whoever wants some, help yourselves. <laughs>